Well, a warm welcome to this talk. It's Thursday the 11th of May. Now, there's been huge numbers of news reports about the uh, arrival in the United Kingdom of the first three-parent baby last week. Lots of reports in the popular press about this. So rather than going to the popular press, I want to go back to the original sources and we'll explain what's going on here. This is the original source that we'll be using from the original authors. Now, this has got pretty big implications, really. It's got implications for uh, biology and ethics. And it's also got interesting reflections for the long term future of humanity. So if you're interested in that, stick around. And that's what we're doing in this video. Now, the reason that this work has been done primarily in Newcastle in the northeast of England is that um, there's a certain number of people, a relatively small number of people with uh, mitochondrial disease. And this, they can pass this disease on to their children, disease of the mitochondria. You will know that the mitochondria are the powerhouse in the cytoplasm of the cell. They produce the energy for the cell. There might be a hundred, there might be a few thousand mitochondria in an individual cell, depending on what the cell has to do. So if it's like a liver cell or a heart cell or a muscle cell that does a lot of work, it could be a few thousand mitochondria. But if they're defective, they can't produce the energy. And the children that are produced... Uh, uh, the, the, the children that are conceived and sometimes born are, are very, very ill or don't make it through pregnancy or die shortly after. Or well, the ones that do live don't live for very long with mitochondrial disease. So this can't be cured. So the idea is to replace the defective mitochondria. Now, mitochondria contain DNA the same as the nucleus of the cell contains uh, DNA. The nuclear DNA contains about 20,000 genes. It depends who you ask. The uh, the Genetic material, the DNA and the mitochondria, contain 37 genes. It's a relatively small part of the genome, but it's still part of the human genome. So let's look at what's, what's happening here. So th this is, um, this is um, there's two ways we can do this. Let's look at these techniques uh, now of the two ways that this can be done. Well, this first technique is called maternal spindle transfer. So here we have the mother's reproductive cell here, the ovum with the nucleus in the centre. And we see that there are mitochondria in the cytoplasm, but we notice that these are defective. They've got a cross in. So it's these defective mitochondria in the cytoplasm that would cause the disease. So what we do is we introduce uh, another ovum from a perfectly healthy woman here. And we see that this also has a nucleus in the middle, of course, also the mitochondria, but we see that these mitochondria are healthy. So this technique involves taking the nucleus with the genetic material from the mother, from this cell here, and taking the nucleus out of this cell there and putting that in there. So now we have the original mum's uh, 23 chromosomes with the mum's genetic material in there. And we also have the healthy cytoplasm with the mitochondria which are now healthy so we've got rid of the unhealthy mitochondria we chuck that out the nucleus that was in this cell is also discarded that's no longer needed and uh, we now have a perfectly healthy cell with the mother's genetic material but healthy mitochondria and then this individual healthy cell here is then fertilized by the uh, dad's sperm now this is all done external to the body of course this is done in the uh, in the sort of test tube situation in, uh, in, uh, in vitro. So here's the sperm that comes along here. And then the nucleus from the sperm containing dad's 23 chromosomes, that goes into the uh, ovum there. The nuclei of the mum and the dad then combine, and we have a new zygote containing the genetic material from the mum and the genetic material from the dad. That cell is then a zygote. So that particular cell there will then divide into two into four via this process of mitosis into untold billions to form the new baby. So that's how that works. And this new baby will have the mum's and the dad's own genetic material, but it will have another woman's mitochondria. So that's where we get this term three parent babies from. So that first technique is called maternal spindle transfer. Now, the second technique that is used is called pronuclear transfer. So again, we start off with the cell, with the healthy mother's genetic material in the nucleus, but the defective mitochondria and the defective DNA in the mitochondria. And again, we introduce a healthy donor ovum from uh, another woman, from another healthy uh, woman. 
with a nucleus and healthy mitochondria. Now, it's a bit different in this situation because both of these ovum are then uh, fertilized by the father's sperm. So that one is fertilized by sperm, and this one is also fertilized by, by sperm. And then that leaves us in a situation where we have what we call pronuclei. So this is a pronucleus here. It's not quite yet the full nucleus of the zygote that's going to form the new baby. And we have the pronucleus there from the sperm. And we have the same in this situation, but this is the donor one, of course, that we, uh, we don't want the nuclear material from here, but we still fertilize it with dad's sperm. So we now have two, uh, two zygotes, or very early zygotes. Now, what actually happens in this technique, it's called a pronuclear transfer. So these pronuclei from here are removed. That's the first pronuclei from the mum. That's the pronuclei from the dad. So they're removed. And then this with the defective mitochondria is discarded. Now, what we want from this one, we want the healthy mitochondria. But of course, we don't want the other woman's uh, genetics in here. So we take that out and we take out the uh, the fertilized, uh, the the component from dad's sperm that fertilized it so these pronuclei here are also discarded and then the pronuclei from the original cell here then go into here like this these are injected into here and we then have a pronuclei from the mum pronuclei from the dad within the donor cell which is essentially donated all of the cytoplasm and the mitochondria and then after a few hours after that the two nuclei will completely fuse form the new zygote and then this process will take place uh, as normal as we've looked at before with the mitosis and the cellular proliferation forming the forming the new baby now the pronuclei are typically removed at about six to eight hours after fertilization and this is actually before the nuclei are fused so some people consider that the new zygote is not fully formed at this stage um, it's a question of uh, belief really whether you think that was a a fully formed zygote or not but the nuclei only fuse after about 18 hours so the pronuclear transfer trans, um, transference takes place at about six to eight hours and then the full uh, nuclear uh, fusion takes place at about 18 hours and that is then a fully formed zygote with dad's genetic material mum's genetic material and the donor woman's mitochondria that goes on to form the next uh, baby so they're the two techniques, and I think you'll agree some pretty interesting biology there. So what you end up with is a new child, a new baby, that's got the nuclear genetic material from mum and dad, as we all have, but the mitochondrial DNA and the mitochondria from a donor woman. It's always, of course, from a woman, from the woman's over that's been donated. The question is, how do these two interact? That's the perhaps slightly unknown part of this. Some of the interactions are known. Probably not all of the interactions are known because, of course, we don't know what we don't know. Now, if these mitochondria come into a baby boy, then when that baby boy reproduces, when he becomes a man and reproduces, only his nuclear DNA will go into the next generation. His mitochondria will die with him. In the same way that my mitochondria that I got from my mother will die with me. I won't pass them on to any, to any children. It's women that pass on the mitochondria. The mitochondria go down the female line from the over. The sperm does not contribute towards the child's uh, mitochondria. So if it's a boy, the mitochondria, the donated mitochondria will die with that boy. If it's a girl, they'll be passed on through all female descendants, through all generations of humanity that comes after that uh, individual girl who becomes a woman who reproduces. So the problem here is this is a change to the germ cell line. That is perhaps the main issue that people are talking about here. Do we want to genetically modify through medical interventions the human germ cell line? So I'm going to ask some questions now. I'm not going to answer them, of course. Um, well, a couple of them I'll be answering, but you, you, you can see what you think because we try and give information on this channel rather than uh, dictate. Um, is this an ethical form of uh, zygote generation? Well, um, I don't think it's any problem um, unless, unless we're using the, the pronuclear transfer method. Here you've got a nucleus from dad's sperm and a nucleus from mum's ovum um, that are being fertilised in the donor egg, but they're being discarded, they're being thrown away. Now, 
the, the issue is when does life begin? Most people would say it begins at fertilization, but because this, uh, be, because the pronuclei are taken away at about six to eight hours, and um, the nuclei don't fuse to eighteen hours, you could argue that the two nuclei have not yet formed a new individual. It really depends on your view on that. But um, the que the question is: is this is this form of zygote generation ethical? Well. Um, in, in current uh, intravena, um, in vitro fertilization, we produce spare embryos all the time at a much later stage than this. So um, if this is ethical, if this is ethical, then this is certainly ethical. Um, if this is unethical, you could argue whether this is unethical or not. But uh, embryos at a much later stage are discarded using in vitro fertilization. Um, whereas this is at the pro fertilization of the nuclei stage um, should reproduction be medicalized well obviously i'm not going to answer that question um, is is reproduction supposed to be a completely natural process all, all medical interventions go against nature i suppose but but I, th I think that really goes on to this next question here question 2a i've called this because it's kind of a sub question is reproduction a right or a privilege or a gift so People that are unable to have their own children, it can be a completely distressing, life life changing, they would say life ruining um, situation for them to be in. But, you know, throughout history, there have been people that, that can't reproduce. Is reproduction a right? Is it part of the sense of entitlement that we have that we can reproduce when we want, if we want? Or, or, or is... Or is is reproduction a privilege? Again, I'm not answering that question. I'm just floating that for you to think about. Um, you know, should medicine automatically help in every situation where an individual wants a particular thing to be facilitated on their behalf? That That is the question. Um, are you happy with germline alteration? So this will go down through the female line, potentially, for the entire future history of the human race. Are you happy about that? Are you comfortable that scientists and doctors are changing the human germ cell line? Okay, we're only talking about the 37 genes in mitochondria, not the 20,000 genes in the nuclear DNA, but it's still human DNA. Um, are you happy with that being changed and that being passed on through subsequent uh, generations? That, that is the, uh, perhaps that's the question. Are you happy with that? Will this change spread through the human population? Um, yes, uh, yeah, it, it, can, it certainly can do. If there's baby girls born, it can pass through the uh, population. So, so yes, that's certainly true. And it could diffuse out through countries, individuals, families, potentially into millions of people because it's, it, it's probable that all of the DNA in all of us human beings, uh, all of the mitochondrial DNA in all of us human beings now came from one woman um, called mitochondria leave now of course that, that, that woman would have had a, a mother um but but um there could have been that bottleneck where we're all descended from one woman because all our mitochondria are really quite quite similar so it's got the potential di to diffuse potentially through huge chunks of humanity um over time um so yeah it could well do that question four could well be in the affirmative question five are there any unforeseen consequences in future generations? Well, I can't answer that. You can't answer that. And to be quite honest, I'm not sure anyone can answer that at the moment. The scientists that are working on this don't see any, but um, scientists have been wrong before. Doctors have been wrong before. Could there be unforeseen circumstances in the next generation or the generation after or the generation after? Um, I don't see any reason why there should be, but what we don't, we don't understand how cells and biology works completely, not by any means, not by any means at all. Basically, we work off a lot of simplified models. So I think the answer to that question is, is we don't know. To that, some people would say that because there's unknowns, we should always err on the side of caution. Again, I'm not answering the question. It's just an interesting question to, to float. Um, could this technology be abused in the future or in other places? Well, that's a pretty short answer to that one. Of course it could. Um, humans abuse all technologies. And we have recent examples of potential uh, biotechnologies being used, some might say abused, in diverse parts of the world that have got implications uh, for potentially all of humanity. So 
The researchers, of course, don't like the term three-parent baby, but it, it, it is fairly accurate. Uh, the mitochondria from a donor woman that could be potentially passed on through all generations. So um, they're the questions. I leave it with you. I don't pretend to give answers, uh, but that is the biology and that is the situation. Thank you for watching.